Hello and welcome to the penultimate edition of On Course for 2012. There's less than three months to go to the Games and things are really hotting up. We've got an update on all the action from the Olympic selection races and the Team GB canoe slalom squad announcement. We salute one of the greatest ever Olympians as he takes on our toughest challenge. And we look back through the mists of time as we meet members of the 1972 Olympic canoe slalom team. But first, we recently got a fascinating insight into the lengths that GB Canoeing's 200m canoe sprint athletes are going to, to give them the edge at the London Games. In the heart of the Hasler base in Gosport, there is a very long building. Its contents used to be top secret, but not anymore. You see, this is Kinetic Ship Tank, a unique testing facility designed to help develop new vessels. But it's now diversifying and has found a very different customer. UK Sport has secured access to the tank and GB Canoeing's 200m squad are making very good use of it. Basically it came about through uh, UK Sport uh, and, and their research and innovation team which is led by Scott Draw in conversations with um, you know, myself and some of the other coaches and, and sports scientists over the last couple of years you know, looking at ways that we can maybe uh, measure and, and uh, plot performance progression over time a little bit more uh, methodically and a little bit more uh, clinically uh, without having to deal with uh, environmental conditions. What we can say is that when we come here, whether we're here in January or whether we're here in June, we're going to have the same conditions. Now the air temperature might be a little bit different, but the water temperature stays around 15 degrees all year round. If we think of what happens at Dorney, uh, you know, in January, Dorney Lake can be 6, 7, 8 degrees. By June, it can be 22 degrees. Now that change in water temperature affects boat speed. So then, are we getting an increase in speed because the athlete's more powerful, more efficient, a better paddler? Or are we getting an increase in speed because the water is now 14 degrees warmer and therefore boat speed's gonna be faster? Whereas if we come here in January and we come here in June, that's, that's taken out of the equation. But really for this 200 meter event where we're going into the games where the margins, like I said, are so small, it just gives the athletes and the coaches confidence that they're doing the work, the right work, or if, the, or if things need to change, they can change with some knowledge of what they need to change without just you know, having a stab in the dark when we might have to do something different. With the Olympic canoe slalom selection trials looming, GB Canoeing held a press day at Lee Valley to introduce members of the media to the key contenders for those places at London 2012. Running alongside this was a reunion of the 1972 Munich Olympic canoe slalom team, as Helen Reeves now reports. In 1972, canoe slalom was introduced to the Olympic programme. It was a fantastic opportunity for the sport to showcase what it was all about to the world. Unfortunately, it was only in the programme for that one year until it was reintroduced in 1992 at the Barcelona Olympic Games. The lovely thing about speaking to the, the 1972 athletes was really finding out about the impact becoming an Olympic sport had on canoe slalom. And then also to find out what the contrast is, the differences between what they were doing in 1972 on the river to what our athletes are actually out there doing today. Yes, well I would have said my time in canoe slalom marked in a way the, the sort of end of the beginning uh, slalom, if, if you can take, take a Churchillian phrase, because it wasn't long before then that we used to arrive on a slalom site and put, put the course up ourselves. Then we had to judge, and we had to paddle, then we had to take the course down, and then we had to go home. So it was terribly amateurish. The comparison with what people do today when they're training for uh, the Olympics is, uh, is chalk and cheese. I was watching some of the Olympic hopefuls today, and clearly they're extremely familiar with the water. And then I was watching some of our um, heritage paddlers on the... Um, legacy course and clearly what the water looks like and what it's actually like when you're in it is different. It's quite good water here as much as you can play games with it. Of course on a river you can't. Augsburg you could uh, because again it's a regulated one off the ice canal um, and then again it became sort of trying to find our way and figure out exactly um, where to go next. And the Olympics does that for you. It certainly brings you through the old world championship route and then on to this great expectation. 
Now, we're going to step off the Olympic Travelator for a moment to look at one of canoeing's toughest tests, the devices to Westminster Canoe Race. But we're not abandoning the Olympic connection altogether, because this year, one of the greatest Olympians ever, Sir Steve Redgrave, stepped across to the dark side and had a go at the race himself. It may have been smiles all round for Steve and Roger Hatfield as they left devices, but there was no doubting how seriously they were taking the task ahead. In his blog the week before, Steve spoke of being unsure about his fitness, and even whether the sheer duration of the 125 mile race was beyond him. But as they travelled down the Kennet and Avon Canal, the two certainly didn't look out of place compared to other crews. Being rowers, both Roger and Steve were new to the delightful art that is portaging, and with 77 stops along the route, they were certainly in for a baptism of fire. But this was all tempered by the support they were getting from well-wishers along the way. There were Redgrave twitchers emerging at every conceivable observation point, all eager to catch a glimpse of the man himself as he paddled past. The two reached the River Thames in Reading at dusk, after 52 miles on the canal, and were apparently looking forward to paddling this next section of the race. But somewhere around Bisham, while bracing for support, Steve picked up a chest strain that would eventually become a component part of their demise. At around half past two in the morning, the two retired near Dorney, fatigued, injured, and probably gutted at failing to reach the end. It would appear though, that they'll both be back again next year to settle a score. And if they do, they can be sure of a warm welcome. Now, we last caught sight of Sir Steve in the devices to Westminster race here at Wokingham Canoe Club on the River Thames. And this was the venue for GB Canoeing's latest event in their para canoe program the pre-selection trials for the World Championships. GB Canoeing have been um, very specific about what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve a Paralympic success. It's not about taking part, it's actually about winning medals. Um, taking part is always very important in any walk of life, but it's very, very particular what we're trying to do, and it really is about winning those medals at Paralympic Games. And what's really exciting about Rio uh, 2016 is that the athletes that we currently have and the ones that we're going to find in the, the next few years are going to be competing for the very first Paralympic medals. That, that's just, it doesn't happen very often in one's life that you're actually competing to, for the very first. It, it's fantastic. Uh, I'm aware of it, all the staff are aware of it, as are the athletes. It's really very exciting. Uh, my first World Championships <laughs> since 86, uh, first Paralympic Games I'd, which I went to was Seoul in 1988. Um, then Barcelona, Atlanta, Sydney, Athens, retired after Athens. Um, I medalled in every games, um, Atlanta being my most successful games. I got two gold, one silver, two bronze. I know just through my swimming, you know, they, we talk about 2016, which is you know four and a half years away, which sounds like nothing, and it's just a roller coaster. Once you get on that, there's no stopping, and you, you know, already people are talking about. It. You think oh, we haven't even had London yet, but uh, short-term goal is is the Worlds in in May. Basically, I used to be a footballer, like amateur footballer, uh, Sunday league, and then uh, had an accident, uh, broke my leg, uh, ended up in hospital, and had been amputated, and then went to a TID day, um, probably about eight months ago now, down in Guildford. Just tried a variant of different sports, and seemed to be good at this one. Uh, never been in a boat in my life until about six months ago. Uh, picked it up pretty quick, fell in a couple of times, and now setting the fastest times. And this year's goal is the World Championships. I'd like to make the final of the Worlds. If I didn't, I'd be quite disappointed now. I mean, when I started it, I would have been happy to have stayed in the boat, but now, five months down the line, it, now things change, and, you know, I want to be the best. I want to be, well, I want to be the world's best. I want to be number one in the world, really. So, making the final this year seems the next progressing, you know. Finally, there's a small matter of the Olympic team selection to deal with. Helen Rees brings us up to date with all the action from the big weekend at Lee Valley and Nottingham. This critical Olympic selection, the London Games, was not for the superstitious, with day one falling as it did on Friday the 13th.
With only four places up for grabs, there was always going to be more tears than joy. But the big question was how quickly those places were going to be claimed. With three days of racing and the best two results counting, it could all be over by the Saturday. With wins on Friday for Lizzie Neve in the women's K1, Richard Hounslow in the men's K1, David Florence in the men's C1, and Florence and Hounslow in the C2, the pressure was on on Saturday for those athletes to seal the deal for their Olympic spot. And that's exactly what happened in all the individual classes, with Lizzie, Richard and David all securing their places on Team GB for the London Olympics. In the C2 class, Tim Bailey and Etienne Stott took the win on day two, making it one all for each of the crews. But following the 2008 Games, there was a rule change that allowed qualified athletes to compete in more than one category. And this means Team GB can enter two C2s, with David Florence and Richard Hounslow already qualifying in their individual categories. So come Sunday, there was only one competition to be decided. And that was the titanic battle of the C2s between Bailey and Stott and Florence and Hounslow. Both crews gave it their all on what was a really tough course. But with the finest of margins, it was Florence and Hounslow that were victorious. Meanwhile, on the same weekend up in Nottingham, it was the start of what's to be a long process to select the Olympic canoe sprint team. But the focus was on three key athletes who could potentially secure their Olympic nomination at this event because of their performances at the 2011 World Championships. These athletes were Ed McKeever in the men's K1 200 metres and Jolly Schofield and Liam Heath in the K2 200 metres. What we actually seen was the first athletes from sprint uh, to gain their nominations for the Olympic Games. That's Ed McKeever in the K1 200 metre. And then in the K2 200, uh, Liam Heath and Johnny Schofield again, stormer of a race. And uh, well done to you know those three athletes. They have been our most consistent athletes uh, in their events, in their Olympic events over the last three years, winning World Championship and European Championship medals. So well done to them. What we also seen yesterday was in the men's K1 thousand uh, event. We seen Tim Brabant, the Olympic champion from 2008. Uh, Tim went head to head with Paul Witcherly, uh, who competed for us at the World Championships last year in the thousand. And that was a fantastic, uh, it was a duel almost going on there uh, in that race between those two athletes. Tim took the win uh, by three one hundredths of a second on the line. Um, however, that's the first race and uh, that race will then go to um, a second opportunity in Poznan in three and a half weeks. And if need be, if we need a third race, we'll go to Duisburg in Germany the weekend after at World Cup races. So there's a lot to play for um, there. And to cap off a spectacular weekend of selection racing, a few days later, the British Olympic Association made their formal announcement of what's to be the Olympic canoe slalom squad. Well, that's it for this penultimate edition of On Course of 2012. Make sure you join us again for what will be a truly packed final edition. We'll see you then.